And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers into the temple. In the red corner, we, ha we have one half of the double-headed monster that is Backwater Games, Asa Olsen. And in the blue corner, we have... Or rather, the other blue corner, or the red corner, whichever you prefer. We have the other half of Backwater Games, Alex Johnson. No relation to Cave Johnson. He's also not a Mr. Johnson. How are you two doing today? Doing oh, we're doing real good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for yeah. com thank you for coming on. So, a tradition of mine is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, I'd like you to both walk me through your first introduction to tabletop games and what made it stick. Mm -hmm. uh, I can start here. I think Alex actually has a more extensive history than I did, but... When I was uh, when I was a teenager ish, my I lived in the middle of nowhere, very rural area. Uh, one of my friends and I had seen D and D at a game shop, and we decided that we want to play. So this is probably I think it was three point five for, uh, at that point in time, and we decided we want to play. Uh, we Saved up some money. We actually didn't know how much it cost. You know, this is before high-speed internet and all that stuff. And we drove back to the game shop. Uh, we were, lived in such a rural area. It was about 50 miles away. So we drove all the way there. And then we saw how expensive the book was. And we came home without buying it. And then we decided to make up our own game, our own way of playing it. And uh, anyway, it, it wasn't quite as fun. We didn't play for a while, but that same friend of mine, after college, after both of us finished our grad schools, uh, when he was getting married for his bachelor party, he said, I've always wanted to play D&D, &D, so let's do it. And this was at the time of 5th edition, and uh, ever since then, it was history. Yeah. Now, um, Alex, what about you? What, about you? What, was your, what was your origin story? Sure, I just have one question for Asa. Does the rural place that you're from have high-speed internet now? Yeah, uh, it does, but it depends on your definition of high-speed. Uh, okay. If it's, All right. you can usually watch Netflix on it, yeah, I guess you can call that high-speed, but it's still okay. pretty poor. I didn't. I don't want to be an urban snob here, but you were, you were saying that in the days of the pre-high-speed internet in rural Wisconsin, and I didn't know if that was like two years ago or... Anyway... <laughs> yeah. Wisconsin. I always love a good, I love a good opportunity to shit on Wisconsin. Um, so, <laughs> a man after my own heart. <laughs> uh, uh, I I do love Wisconsin. It, I mean, everyone needs an ugly step stepchild to make fun of, I guess. Uh, but enough about so, Illinois. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll stop. <laughs> uh, so, for my own uh, role playing experience, that started for me uh, at. Uh, second edition of AD and D, my well, basically, I had two two friend groups when I was growing up. One of them were the theater nerds, and the other were the Warhammer nerds. And the theater nerds uh, introduced me to a second edition AD and D in like the waning months of 1999, so right right before third edition came out. And we played a couple games, and it was fine, but. Uh, you know, we were a bunch of 10-year-olds who didn't know what we were doing. Um, but then my Warhammer friends introduced me to the Warhammer fantasy role-playing game, uh, which is, to this day, still one of my favorite rule sets and one of my favorite worlds. Uh, but that group took much more, you know, we did both miniature wargaming as well as the role-playing game. And that that campaign lasted mostly through my entire junior high, middle school years. Uh, and then I only really came back to D&D &D once we were into uh, 3.5. Um, and then I got uh, some more experienced theater nerds in my D&D &D group who knew how to tell a story really well. And it was 
that that really uh, I think lit the fire for me as a role player before I just like exploring the world of the Warhammer thing or Warhammer world and I liked you know the fact that my miniatures could also fit in that world really nicely um, but so it was that sort of cross contamination between that really grim dark gritty low fantasy role playing and then the epic high fantasy that was D D. so i've always lived in between those two worlds uh and yeah it's it's been that way since uh i was just in a wee sprout in, in junior high yeah now but now um for first off since this is since this is a double-headed monster with with your projects i have to ask this question because i've asked it plenty of times with other, with other projects, um, which one to use the Abbot and which one to use the Costello? Oh, what does that mean? I guess maybe Alex knows off the top of his head, but <laughs> did I just date myself by bringing up Abbot and Costello, or did or did or did you date but, yourself by not knowing what I meant? Uh, probably both. <laughs> a little in column B. Yeah, uh, I mean, to my knowledge, Asa and I have never crash landed on the moon. Uh, and I don't think that either of us like baseball. Actually, that's not true. I like baseball a bit. Uh, but yeah, I guess I, uh, if you would like to expound on that a little bit, because I think we're both youngins. Um, well, putting aside the fact that there, that there is a, um, there, there was a, there was a fantasy parody of, of who's on first called who's the tank. You know who's the tank? <laughs> what's the mage? I don't know. Who's the priest? <laughs> uh, and it's you. It's usually who. It's usually who's the one who comes up with the ideas, and who's the one who's tr who tries to be the voice of reason. You can't see it, but huh. I'm doing finger quotes. <laughs> well, yeah, I think that makes sense. I, I think we switch on and off, uh, but uh, Alex is a dreamer and creator by heart, and I'm uh, I'm more of a doer or a builder, I think, but mm -hmm. I think it's pretty fair that we both uh, that we switch on and off with it. What do you think, Alex? Uh, I th I think that's true. I do think we each have our our moments of Abbott and our moments of Costello. But uh, I mean, I will direct you to a ongoing text conversation we had over the weekend of Asa presenting this wonderful idea that we were thinking about including, and then me hounding him for the remaining three days being like, what if we did this? How would this work? Could this be a thing that we could do? Uh, and until he was like, Alex, I've, I've been gardening and landscaping for three days. <laughs> Can you calm oh, my, down, please? <laughs> my favorite example of that, though, is How Backroads, our Kickstarter project right now, got started, which was uh, Alex was already dreaming it up before we even had officially finished uh, Backwater. And Alex said he was just going to work on a quick write-up for something. And when he sent it to me, it was over 20 pages already. And, uh, and that, I mean, that was enough for, for me. It sold me on it because it was pretty great. But, yeah, Alex is a, a natural creative. He, he just uh, pops things off the top of his head. And mm -hmm. that's why he's also great. And, you know, we met through by playing tabletop games together uh, through a, a mutual friend group. And, uh yeah, we, we were both players initially, and yeah, we got along with each other, but I've always appreciated Alex as a, as a role player and creative, and uh, as we slowly transitioned into these projects, uh, it became clear that I think that we made a pretty good team in that way, as sort of Abbott and Costello. I agree, and oh, sorry, uh, I, I mean, just, to, just to round it up, I would say uh, m the majority of the time it's me spouting off what uh, what nonsense that I think we should do. And Asa being really good at either saying, Alex, calm down, or Alex, here's how we can actually make that work without it breaking the game. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's our dynamic, and I think it's served us pretty well so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, my intent, now, I should know my, my intent with this is to dip into both um, Backwater and Backroads, because much like how Stan Lee said every comic is someone's first, I think the same thing can apply to role-playing games. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but in both in both cases, there is a lot of emphasis on 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 gothic horror, mm -hmm. and mm 
Mm-hmm. What I'd what I'd be curious about is what's the what's the appeal to you guys of that particular style of horror compared to other types. I've asked this with somebody else I've had I've had on, but I'm always interested in the unique responses that this hap- this creates. Yeah. Well, and I'll sort of jump on this right away because this is stuff I, I think a lot about and I, I don't think there's ever a really good answer, but it, we aren't just talking about gothic horror itself, you know, thinking about uh, its origins and, you know, the castles of Italy, etc., those sorts of settings and depictions, but specifically we're interested in forms of American gothic and, uh, and Backwater, we sort of started with, with Southern gothic. And I, I think it was, uh, for us personally, there are a number of things that sort of came together, but I do think that there's a, a greater maybe cultural appeal to, but I'll say for us, I was living in Arkansas at the time when, uh, when we started on Backwater, so that one's focused a lot more on Southern Gothic, it's set in the Deep South. I lived right on the border of Arkansas, Louisiana, and you know that's part of the setting here. It's primarily set in New Orleans, but... Uh, you could still, yeah, it, it was just a stone's throw away for me, really. And for Southern Gothic, we had been thinking about a post-apocalyptic setting, and there's just a lot of conventions in Southern Gothic that really fit it. You know, a lot of Southern Gothic is set in a sort of uh, reconstruction era, and thinking about after the apocalypse, it's people pulling together, you know, the fragmentary remains of uh, of in this case, of a nation. And that's what one of the things that we're interested in. And then I think there are a number of other themes that really fit for us too. But I think culturally, the appeal of the Gothic genre is it's that, atmos- it's that atmosphere of these you know, dilapidated houses, um, these sort of creepy settings. And for us, it gains that additional relevance when it's in this American setting as uh, both of us are from from the US originally. Mm-hmm. And then the, the last thing I'll just add to it as, a, as we sort of moved in broader into American Gothic, we we're thinking a lot about that, about the natural landscape and how that uh, shows up in, uh, in American Gothic, thinking about like young Goodman Brown and walking through the woods or thinking, uh, thinking about a lot of these stories that explore the American wilderness, which, you know, vast and in many of these settings, relatively unexplored and almost consuming them uh, whole and something that really freaked them out. So that's something we moved into, into the outskirts. And then I think culturally there's other relevances too, but one of the big things that we're picking up on in Backroads is, well, in a lot of these stories and settings uh, with American Gothic, there's this extremism aspect. So Puritanism, for example, thinking about many of the works or thinking about Nathaniel Hawthorne and, you know, his family history, but also how Puritanism shows up in some some of his books. And I think we see a lot of that uh, today, uh, too. And something Alex, I know, likes to talk about is, well, post-apocalyptic stories, which ours is, um, they often look on the present and they use a post-apocalyptic setting to view it anew, to view it in a different way. And I think our books in some ways, are looking at how things are in the world right now uh, with the, uh, you know, especially with extremism and is trying to predict them in a more uncanny, uh, both comical and creepy way. Yeah. Um, I should note that I'm not going to, I'm not going to say that there, that there's a whole, that there's a whole lot of, a whole lot of unexploredness, even, even with, even with the wilderness nowadays. I will, however, say that Growing up, I was more scared of werewolves than I was of vampires. <laughs> well, I think that uh, yeah, I, I think in the unexploredness, it's really interesting. So I, I'm someone who grew up in a rural, very, very rural area. You know, my nearest neighbor was my grandma, and she was over over a mile away. Like you can barely see a house from where I grew up, and I grew up on a, on a farm. But it's interesting as I meet people throughout my life, and not everybody's this way, but I've met many people who are very afraid of driving down these, you know, these back roads, uh, these places where you aren't going to see another person, and they're afraid of getting stuck out there and getting lost. 
And I think you see some of that in like The Hills Have Eyes, for example, or other sorts of films that play up on play up on this isolation, especially out in the countryside. Uh, and he, although when it comes to isolation, the <clears throat> the poster child for that for me has always been the thing. Although that's a diff although that's a different type of isolation. Um I joke the reason I can the reason I kinda joked about being more scared of, of werewolves than vampires largely has to do with a lot of the a lot of the spooky stories that I that I grew up with with um with the things that were in the forests. And having having a having at least one encounter with bears certainly doesn't exactly doesn't help that. Oh yeah, well, and I've had plenty of stuff like that I can tell you about too. And I want to hear Alex's answer to this mm -hmm. question also, just because I feel like Alex and I often come from different perspectives on what these things appeal to us. But mm -hmm. uh, I can tell you, my family has many weird stories, but I've got I've got one about Bigfoot, which is something that many people in my family will claim to be true. But I know that's already mm -hmm. that's probably piquing your interest. But I'll let Alex take a swing at that answer. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, Alex. Yeah, why don't you give an answer after Ace is done talking about his Bigfoot story? That's fair. <laughs> yeah, all right. I'll just tee me up to give this really interesting answer. I can't compete with Bigfoot. Um, uh, I guess for me and, you know, for my thoughts on the matter, like, uh, Gothic horror generally and uh, American Gothic and Southern Gothic particularly... Uh, they have this weird, in, weird relationship to the past that I really enjoy. Um, you know, I I went to school to be a historian. My partner is a historian. Uh, you know, it's an important part of my life and uh, you know my thought process. And you know, growing up, we we are taught a version of the past that is you know, interesting, but also kind of uh, optimistic, I guess, and you know, the sort of moral arc of the universe bending towards justice, that sort of stuff. Um, and I appreciate that Gothic views the past not as, maybe not necessarily as something that you can learn from, maybe it does that, but like the past is, is, is sinister in Gothic and Southern Gothic. Like there are, there are secrets there that are scary and maybe you shouldn't know what they are. Um, and I think uh, Gothic and Southern Gothic and American Gothic um, are, are particularly useful tools for looking at, uh, as Asa said, looking at our own present and looking at what our, our own skeletons are and what, what our, you know, our, our own past ghosts are. And that's why I've really enjoyed being able to work on Backwater and Backroads is because there are, you know, we are looking at our own present through the eyes of these post-apocalyptic weirdos who, you know, they have incomplete information. They're trying to reconstruct what life is like for us. And so thinking about what their own sort of skeletons would be, like what, what, what would scare them about the past? Obviously the apocalypse, but there are other things as well uh, that end up uh, being reinforced through, uh, especially back roads, um, you know, with this, focus on exploration and exploration horror and not knowing you know what's out there and if the stuff that you find out there that looks normal is in fact very very dangerous um and those those are the sort of themes that i've really enjoyed playing with with gothic and why i think it's been uh you know it's such a cultural force yeah and just out of curiosity since exploration is one of the themes that you've mentioned um, I'm curious if either of you have ever played in or run a hex crawl type adventure. Uh, so, I, I, yes and yes. Um, we one of the things that we did in my my very first D uh, D campaign, and probably the reason one of the reasons it didn't end so well was we it was a hex crawl exploration. Uh, I think it was using one of the AD and D like wilderness books, um, but none of us were in it for that. We didn't really care about the, <laughs> the resource management or who was going to fall into uh, a crevice and get a disease. You know, we we were there to kill monsters, and 
Uh, you know, looking back on it, obviously a 10 year old DM isn't going to be able to, to, I think, flesh out all of the potential of a hex crawl. Uh, and so actually one of my motivations for, uh, the exploration in St. Louis, which ends up, um, using a hex grid, uh, a hex crawl system with random tables and whatnot was I wanted to go back and do this campaign and do it right. You know, I wanted to be able to make something that's drawing on uh, this, the tradition of a hex crawl game, uh, while hopefully uh, bringing something new to the table, um, if that answers your question. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that I found kind of interesting with with um, with the set with the setup that you have for back roads is the fa is the fact that you you put it, you put it in that that somebody can use back roads as the, as a starting point just as much even if it is a expansion for backwater and what mm -hmm. i was kind of reminded of is the is the different core lot the different core lines within the world of darkness meta series i'm curious if that was an influence for taking that decision um, not, not for me personally. I don't know if uh, Alex has any in input on that either. But uh, for me, uh, part of me just wants people to be able to start in whatever setting that they have. So we're hoping to continue expanding this. Hopefully, you know, we're getting pretty close to being funded here. We're about 10 days out, so fingers crossed. Uh, but we've had people ask uh, uh, more than a few times about different areas of the American lands, which is what we call this post-apocalyptic nation. Uh, that's uh, that's a major component of our setting. So we started in the Deep South, and now we're in the outskirts, which is technically outside of the American lands in St. Louis. But we have other wards. There's the Heartlands, there's Tidewater, there's the Gulf. And people have, uh, have asked us what's going on in some of these areas. People have also started to write their own campaigns or the, in their own lore form, too. One of the things we love about our Discord is we get to hear a little bit about what people are, are doing in their own games for it. But we really want people to be able to pick them up and run with whatever setting that they have. Mm -hmm. And I also, something that I think is sort of a pain, and you know, it might be different down the road, but I think it can be a pain to, you know, here's a new setting. This is the one that you're picking up on Kickstarter from this indie game creator, and it requires you to buy a whole nother book just in order to play it. I think that can uh, be a bit of an impediment for people who are trying to get into this new system here too. So I think those are some of the factors that at least go into it for me. Uh, is that about right for you too, Alex? Uh, I mean, to an extent, yeah. I think I think portability and the ability to just grab a, a module off the shelf, as it were, uh, is certainly a primary factor i don't know if world of darkness specifically was an influence in terms of like the the different uh setting books um i mean when i was i worked at a bookstore for a while and i, I had quite the collection of vampire books i don't know where they've gone they're probably in storage somewhere um but like i i don't think i've ever played physically a world of darkness game beyond uh just reading the setting material which is delightful um, but you know, I think it, I think the real inspiration for me just came from like the overwhelming amount of source material across the board for any, almost all major RPGs at this point, um, I think is pretty intimidating if you don't have the time and money to dedicate to it. And so, you know, uh, I think the ability to just grab a book doesn't matter if it's backwater or backroads, but you're going to be able to play that game uh without anything else um you know for a relatively inexpensive investment in you know time money and mental capacity uh, and i think i think that's the real reason reason we've uh i mean apart from the fact that we're nerds and we've built this thing that we like we kind of want to stick with it um you know that's that's why we've decided to stay the course uh in the american lands rather than branching off into something else which is good because if if you had branched off into more traditional forms of fantasy, even if, even a more gothic turn of it, um, might get lo might get a bit more lost in the shuffle, so to speak. 
yeah, I do think that, you know, uh, and I think there's a lot of really cool stuff happening in terms of the genre of fantasy or the different styles uh, or subgenres of fantasy, too. And I honestly, I support a lot of those things on Kickstarter just because I want to I want to see what comes out of them. I like to see people's new takes or new systems for it, too. But I, I do think for us, another appeal of, of American Gothic and Southern Gothic is it's something a little bit new. Uh, it's moving in a different direction from uh, from a lot of this fantasy that uh, that that we that we tend to see. But I do love me a good <laughs> good fantasy games, too, of the- course. And I I do I do as well. I just um I've been I've been very critical over the years of what of what I like to call the Tolkien melting pot or the idea that something something has to be done a certain way in order for it to be counted as fantasy. And this isn't a new issue either because I remember being on forums way way in the late not in the late nineties and seeing people argue about whether or not Planescape counts as fantasy. Or if it should count as science fiction or weird fiction. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think uh, I can definitely see that. But I, a lot of people expect sort of Tolkien esque things for fantasy they, uh, when they're when they're thinking of tabletop role playing games. But of course, there's plenty of stuff out there now, which is something that I appreciate. That yeah, uh, explores different veins and different cultures too. Now. One thing, speaking speaking of speaking of that, um, one thing that I did one thing that I did notice when I was do, when I was doing my research is the fact that you guys are using a um, a d a d twenty based approach. But unless I'm unless I'm mistaken, there's no other die t- there's no other die type that you're using for most resolution. Everything begins and ends with d twenty. Yep, that's right. Um... So yeah, D twenty system first and foremost, all skill rolls uh, and what we call attribute rolls, all made with the D twenty. Only things that aren't would be you know if you're uh, dealing damage to someone or dealing duress. Uh, so those things are going to be on the other dice, but pretty much everything is D twenty. Mm-hmm. And this is an original system too, which I'll uh, I'll throw out there and. You can see a short description of it on the Kickstarter too for those who are interested. And also, add our we have a quick start which is free, uh, and it's it's always been well, it's been pay what you want, but we just put it as free for now during the Kickstarter. And then we also have a solitaire game, which is free on the Kickstarter too. Mm-hmm. And uh, for the rest of the Kickstarter, you can grab that on itch on our itch page. Mm-hmm. But our game system is uh, really a skill-based system, so we have a number of skills. You know, maybe, uh, maybe not so many as some of the other games you're familiar with, but we. Believe I think me we have when a, I say it, you're better off not having a skill list as large as some of the games I'm familiar with. Yeah, there's no, there, nothing over sixty or nothing over, <laughs> or you know, we don't have all these sub skills or anything like that. We're skill-based, but we have about twenty, and so there's not any of that sort of. What do you call it? Uh, anal- is it analysis paralysis? Or yeah, that's you don't the term to, that I use. Yeah, you don't have to sort through as many as many skills uh, in, in this instance. But one of the reasons we went with that skill base is there's combat in this game. Combat can be an important part of it, but it's only one of many things that you can do, and combat can be very consequential. So we like people. Uh, playing as a team and we like the fact that people can build characters that aren't combat oriented or don't need to be good at combat to have fun so they can actually build the characters that they want and this isn't always the case with D, but you know i've been in plenty of games where combat is so central and almost turns into a slog or an obligation at some point in time and every time you build a character it almost feels like at least in in some of those games okay i gotta think about what i'll do here in combat but that's not the case as much for backwater and backroads, where it's more, you know, what are some what are some of the things that you can bring to the table, and they don't have to be combat. What fits with your character's backstory? What's the story that you want to tell? Yeah. Although, and then I'll just build on some of the final things for the skills yeah. here. Just mentioned, sorry, and I think some of the unique things is we have 
another thing called health roles and resolve roles, which are, are a bit unique, but they might harken back to Call of Cthulhu uh, for those of you uh, who are familiar with that. I imagine many out there. Mm-hmm. But instead of rolling over, as you might usually do in our system, with health and resolve roles, you try to roll under. Mm-hmm. And these are in the instances where you're trying to avoid getting a condition, like the bleeding condition where you take damage each turn because you've been, say, hit with a shotgun or something, you know, so, something really deadly like that. And what makes them a bit more unique is because it's a health roll, every time you take damage and your health goes down, it's a little bit harder to succeed on those rolls because you're still trying to roll under. You're still trying to roll under it. So every time you take damage, that difficulty increases a little bit. So those are some of the many unique elements of our game system that I think we can highlight here. Yeah. <clears throat> now, with that with that in mind, when it, one thing I'm one thing I'm curious about just just looking over the just looking over the um, skill system alone. Um, I do see that you had, you guys are doing a skill point system. Um, what would be what would be the determining factor in terms of in terms of how many skill points a character is going to get per level? Is it a, would it be root would it be rooted in the archetype that they pick, or would it be something different? Uh, so all characters actually get the same number of skill points per per level. Uh, so and the way we originally had it was something more along the lines of Call of Cthulhu when we were play testing it, and it would actually be you know you get skill points, but you have to uh, use them in skills that you succeeded on since the last time you leveled or something along those lines. Uh, but now it's more so you get two skill points, but there is another factor in there. So during character creation, you pick an ideal. Uh, you know, it, instead of your class or archetype determining what skills you get, your ideals do. So your ideal might be Wanderlust, which is one of the new ideals for Backroads, which is all about exploration. And with that ideal, you have familiar skills. And those ones are well, skills that you might have had more experience in because you're somebody with Wanderlust. And those tend to be cheaper. So they might only cost one skill point to take a proficiency level on theirs. Whereas if you want to take something outside of that, it ends up costing two skill points instead. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the determining factors there. Yeah. Now, when it comes to... Speaking of that, when it comes to this the concept of archetype and level... um, was was it always your intention to go with to go with a level based system, or had you guys kicked around the idea of of doing freeform advancement early on? Uh, and sorry, I'm talking so much here again, Alex. I, I think uh, we experimented with a bunch of things, but in the end, uh, in the end of pretty much most of everything that we tried sort of took us back to a level system. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I'd say it's, it's, we've been pretty solidly in that level system the entire time. All right. I can get, I can get behind that. And um, to that, to that end, uh, I did, I did see that there are certain, there are certain abilities that an archetype grants at certain levels, I believe, a couple at level one, then four, eight, then every um, fourth level up up till twentieth. Mm-hmm. Um, what, but what benefits would be what benefits would be granted in between those levels? Yeah, so there are a couple things. So one with every level that you get, you also get those skill points. But then every so often, there are a couple other benefits that you can get. So one of them, for example, is you get mastery. And uh, when you get mastery, you pick a skill, and it's for all the skills except for combat skills, actually. Mm -hmm. But you pick a skill, and with that skill, if you roll uh, a dirty 19 or a dirty 20, either of those can count as a critical success. So those are some of the other features. And then along the way, especially as you grant get abilities too, depending on what module you go with, uh, as that was important to us, we wanted to create a modular system, which is something that Alex really pushed for and helped develop in in here and I think made the game so much better and more flexible to build those characters that we like. Mm -hmm. Uh, But along with those modules, you uh, get to upgrade some of your stats too. Yeah. 
And since that was brought up, Alex, let me let me ask you about that because modular system can take a lot of different interpretations depending on who I ask. So, what what would you say modular system entails regarding backwater slash back roads? Uh, yeah. For sure, uh, it is it, modular. Does feel like one of those buzzwords uh, that you know people use, and yeah, there are definitely different interpretations for it. Uh, but for me, modular meant that I don't want um, you know your your archetype does tell you what you can do, but I wanted there to be almost uh, not an infinite amount of flexibility because I, we don't want things to be overwhelming. But uh, we wanted it so that you could have a party that has two slayers, for example. You know, the slayer is our most sort of baseline fighter archetype style. Like, they, they go out and they kill monsters. Um, but we wanted a party to be able to have two slayers that are completely different in terms of their skill set abilities, in terms of their combat abilities, and in terms of what they can bring to the table. So... Uh, with the system that we designed, we put in place uh, these different um, modules that, what we called modules, that have uh, various focuses. So, for instance, uh, you can be a fighter that is better at uh, more defensive combat, or you can be a slayer that's better at defensive combat. You can be a slayer that is better at ranged combat, or you can be a slayer who is a tactician. Um, and then as you level up, your archetype gets access to a, a broader array of these modular abilities. So you may be able to dabble in uh, some skill-based knowledge roles, or you may be able to uh, look at medicine as an option to give your character a little bit of healing power to bring to the group. So for me, modular was the ability to make different characters out of these archetypes. Uh, that meant that it was really up to the player and what their uh, character would be that they would then be able to fit whatever these modules are. They could fit those abilities into their character in a way that both made sense uh, and, and was effective at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that's, some, that's something that I'm, all that I'm always on the eye out for because... I'm. I'm not a. I've seen some people say that cl that classes are too limiting and we need to go more freeform. I am. I'm always of the opinion that neither side neither side is superior. Both of them have their drawbacks. But I think I think a ideal approach is what I what I've called crunch medium. Oh, not exact. Not exactly the sprawling freeform of of the of the of the whole XP as currency approach, but not at, not as extremely extremely structured in the play as not with approach that's in the other end of the pendulum. Yeah, I agree. I, in terms of you know, I I do love a good crunch. <laughs> um, I can I come from the Warhammer Fantasy role playing background, which is pretty darn crunchy at the end of the day. Um, but I mean, really, the the idea was. Uh, it was almost to divorce from numbers in a way. Uh, you know, we wanted our, our primary goal was to make uh, it so that people could make interesting characters, so that an archetype. I mean, we're almost going against what archetype by definition means, uh, because the, you know the archetype. You, you, they're so they can be so vastly different that uh, I'm losing myself here. <laughs> That, uh, you know, the, the numbers matter, but at the end of the day, for, for me, making a modular system was so that people could be telling as interesting a po as possible a stories with as interesting as possible a characters who don't need to be effective purely in uh, the rigid role that they are defined by, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I, I think it's interesting that we end up using the word archetype there, but I, I do think it's fitting in some ways because... You know, you're starting, you might be starting with an archetype, but what you end up developing even by the end of the character creation process, which has some unique steps that help flesh out your character, you end up creating something new. And for me, like if I watch actual plays and listen to streams, I think one of the cool things 
that I like to hear and see, you know, if it's a fifth edition D and D stream is are the unique things that people do with their characters. Like if you think about it, yeah, you're a level 12 paladin. How many level 12 paladins have I seen before? But even within the bounds and the limited number of things that you can do uh, within, you know, that, that system of characters, I like to see how people get creative within the rules. It's sort of like detective fiction where it's so mired in convention where the best novels, a lot of times, in my opinion, at least, are the ones that manage to be original or creative within all of these conventions. But for us, you know, we wanted a little bit more freedom. And I think it's great that we can let people start with an archetype. It gives them a sense of what their character could be. And from there, they get to decide what they want their player or what they want their character to be. Mm -hmm. My acid test has always been if if I can if I can have two people in the in the same class archetype, whatever, and have them go into different um, different endpoints at the at the same tier. That's a success. Yeah, and I and I love that too, and I and. That's sort of something that Alex and I set out to do when we were creating the character creation system. And I've said this elsewhere too, and I've said it on Twitter, And uh, but if anybody's on the fence and uh, aren't sure if they want to try out back roads or backwater, just use our quick start system, create a character, and I think you might just enjoy the character creation process because it helps bring about this story and even that is fun that's part of the game mm -hmm. and there are lots of other games out there like it too but i i think it's enjoyable in that uh, yeah when you when you do that character creation process it might sell you on the game but that's something that alex and i wanted to do because we started with just four archetypes four classes and then backroads brings in another four but we want we wanted there to be able to be more players playing in the same class and not being redundant with each other. And you can do that at level one uh, mm -hmm. with, with our system. And the further you go, the more unique, the more developed, the more you can create the character that you want to create. Yeah. <clears throat> now, that brings me to something I've been dancing around for the longest time, but I think I think it's time to address the elephant that's decided to take a crash on my couch. I really need to get a bigger couch. And that is the magic question. Now, I have a love-hate relationship with, ma with magic systems in a whole host of games, largely because, as a dear, a dear friend of the show had, had once said, when not designed properly, ma uh, magic users can can um, ha can be a situation where they get more game out of the game. So, given that you given that you in the original four you have the se you have the seers, and in the archetypes in backroads you have the sparklock. There's a few questions that I have regarding the regarding the way magic or its equivalent would be used. First, is magic use treated as a skill? Uh, it is not a skill per se, um, uh, but yeah, it is ability based. So you slowly have to get those abilities. And the other thing, which might even be your second question, is uh, it comes at a cost. So there's blood magic, which is, you know, with these characters can use. That's where you expend uh, one or more of your health points in order to use that ability. And there is uh, sort of like a psychic magic, the sight, which requires you to spend resolve. Uh, and then there's one in between, which is death magic, which requires a little bit of blood, a little bit of, little bit of your resolve in order to make them happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, not ability-based per se, or not, excuse me, not skill-based per se, but rather based in abilities. Well, the reason I asked about about whether it's skill based is because I want I wanted to find out if this was a if this was a case of fire and forget or if the act of casting a spell is one that you'd have to roll for to see if there to see if there's success or failure. Yeah, there is uh, rolling involved, and it depends on the ability. So some abilities require your opponent to roll, sort of like 
you like a day, uh, excuse me, sort of like a saving throw might be in Dungeons and Dragons, uh, but these are attribute rolls. And other times you're the one doing the roll. So for example, there is a blood magic ability, which uh, somebody uh, gets to shoot some fire. And in that instance, they do have to make a range roll. Mm-hmm. Now, with the, with that in mind, the other the other avenue when it comes to the whole when it comes to the whole fire and forget is whether is whether a whether a spell that you get or or similar effect is is in that what is in that one particular effect and cannot be changed, or if there's ways to modify and tweak it. Uh, can you explain a little bit more? Sorry. Um. Now, fire and forget is a, is a concept that I wish I could say I wish I could credit myself for, but it predates me. Basically, basically, it's saying that a game that a game that has that kind of principle with its magic, if you were to use this, if you were to throw a fireball that would get thrown with that system, would have the exact same range, do the exact same damage, no matter who's casting it. Mm, gotcha. Yeah, so these do change over levels, which again, I'll, I'll point uh, to Alex too. And so I think that's something that we came across when we were designing and play testing, but uh, it depends on the ability. Uh, some of them increase with levels and you can actually take the ability multiple times even if you want to increase it. Uh, yeah, so those are, those are factors in there as well, uh, but they don't get overpowered, uh, I would say. I think they're still pretty evened out. And they also, some of them have other variables too. For example, you might be able to expend up to three hit points or health points, excuse me, if you want to use a spell. And depending on the number of health that you expend, you might be able to deal greater damage. So those are some of the variables and they do scale uh, or they can scale with levels too. Yeah, and the, uh, the other thing that's thing that's always a concern of mine when it comes to magic systems is making sure that magic do, doesn't step on other people's toes and if it's and if it sounds like I'm I'm picking fun at a few spells from D, from D&D that's because I am um especially <laughs> especially stuff like knock that's my poster boy for what not to do um I pick on knock because yeah. it's a case of well, why why do we need to have a thief around when you can just have the wizard have cast knock? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think one of the benefits of having the modular system that we do is that uh, even characters that uh, so seers uh, are not uh, so again they're like seers are not locked into being a purely sort of magic role to start. Um, like when we were play testing. I made a level 20 seer who was basically a combat character, like a gunslinger character. Uh, and their whole shtick was uh, they were able to manipulate fate and whatever in order to get best of two roles on their attack roles. Um, and so you know, I think one of the benefits that we've seen with uh, the modular system is that it's, it's pretty impossible for anyone to step on anyone else's to- toes um uh and especially for for the the magic users the seers and the sparklocks um you know with sparklocks there there isn't anyone else who can interact with old world technology the way that they can um and with seers you know they have um such a broad range of abilities from telepathy to being able to shoot fire out of their blood or boil someone else's blood um you know they the skills that they have aren't coming from their magical abilities necessarily. They're coming from their character background. And so, you know, in terms of stepping on another character's toes, I think it's more a question of as, as characters are being created and leveled, you know, the, the party making sure that there is a broad selection of skills at the table, as opposed to, you know, I don't think that magic users in our system, uh, are going to be barging in and saying, no, don't do that. I can do it more better than you, um, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. And I wouldn't say it's impossible for overlap, What I guess is sort of what you're just saying there. You know, you can do it, but sort of up to 
of the players, but I would say that there are pretty, there even with the, the number of modules and abilities that the game has, which there are a lot, um, I don't really think that there's that much, uh, there really isn't that much overlap uh, between what they can do. Uh, and I think depending on, and this is sort of what Alex was saying too, the trajectory that a character takes, whatever abilities they grab are going to have their own unique spin or flavor based on their background or the type of build that that person is going for. So I think it's not impossible. I think it could happen, but I think it's a little less likely unless character, unless players really want to shoot for the same character, which might be a different, different type of conflict at the table. Mm -hmm. And as a follow-up to that, are any of you familiar with the term gish? Uh, we, we lost Alex here for a second, but uh, <laughs> I am not uh, familiar, familiar with the term. What is, what is the term? Gish. G-I-S-H. Do you know that one, Alex? Are you talking about the... Uh, no, it's gif. Never mind. Sorry. Uh, I, do, I don't. Or is it gif? Is it gish or don't gish? You, don't you start with that. <laughs> I just had to deal with that a week ago. But Gish and it does it does have it does have its traits to Gith. Um but it is basically the concept of so of someone who is able to hold their own in rel relatively in both in both physical combat and Casting. Um, some archet some archetypes, some archetypes, some um, claim to do it, but don't do it all that well. Some archetypes do it way too well. Looking at you, D looking at you, old school elf. But I'm curious if if some I'm curious if um it's something that's possible within this system. Yeah. I would say it's a, my, you know, and I'm, I admit to Googling some of this right now here too. Uh, I would say probably not so much. I don't think you're going to find that character who is sort of a jack slash master of, of the of core trades, we might say. I think that, um, I think the tricky thing here is, you know that sis that term is based on a system like D and D, where you really do get some pretty distinct uh, roles for characters. And of course, there's like there's casters and there's combat, right? You get their fighters, you get uh, fighters and barbarians, you get sorcerers and wizards, and then you get people who are sort of in in the in between space, like paladins, etc. But I, I think that the way that the backwater, that backwater and backroads are set up, that that sort of, uh, that sort of, that term doesn't quite uh, mesh with it because it, we don't really have those, uh, you know, characters are not really going to be so singular or, and they definitely cannot be masters of multiple things, but they might be able to do things well in multiple spheres, but they aren't going to be true masters at them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, with that in mind, what are you guys, what are you guys shooting for as far as the page count for backroads? Well, I'll admit that uh, we we approximate two hundred and fifty pages for backroads, which is bigger than backwater. And uh, but I actually think and. I think Alex will agree with this too. We're probably we're shooting out. We end up going to hit over two hundred and fifty, but we sort of calculated this uh, a bit into our costs. Uh, we're pretty close to two hundred and fifty as is, and we brought in a third writer on the project too, uh, who's wrapping up some stuff. So uh, I'm guessing we aren't going to quite hit three hundred, but we're going to be more along the lines of probably two hundred and seventy-five or so. Yeah, I think we'll be very lucky if we stay under 300, to be quite honest. Oh, we, uh, well, we think, have to for cost. Exactly. I think <laughs> but, going to be, like, but I think yeah, there's going to be but, some serious uh, editing and, and hard, sad choices <laughs> that need to happen. And part of that is because we have expanded. Like, we did a, a fair amount for the setting for Backwater, but 
Uh, we've really done a little bit more with the setting for back roads and then we are trying to keep uh, as much of the rule system in there as possible. So again, people can pick it up and play without owning backwater. Uh, but the other component is we're also trying to add a few more features as well. So we mentioned some hex crawl options in there and some other travel or exploration horror related options that, that we're going to throw in. So I, I'd say 275 is probably going to be the, the real uh, the real approximate number there. But our, we are not going over 300. <laughs> Knock on wood right now. I was going to say, you, you've heard it here fo first, folks. <laughs> We're making a promise to not do that, and that promise is mostly to ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, never, t I'm just saying, never tempt the gods of irony. For one, <laughs> and for two, you do realize that if it goes over 300, I'm never letting you hear the end of it, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, now we'll, we definitely won't go above that. But yeah, our goal is is under. Uh, I do think that we, we sort of organize it more with, with some more technical, uh, maybe edit, technical editing, technical writing styles, sort of like a reference book, which hopefully makes it a little bit easier when, uh, when people do have to flip through. But the ideal is that people do not have to do so much flipping. It's not like you're looking up all the same three page long spells obviously an exaggeration of like D, D or anything like that so ideally less flipping there and yeah uh, of the material that's going to be extra this time around more of it is is some of that setting information mm -hmm. so lots of good stuff to read for those of you who like just to buy rpg books for reading well i review them so i'm not far off yeah but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank both of you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Oh, this has been great. Yeah, thank you. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm from Wisconsin. So. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.